Good morning and welcome to worship this morning here with the North Kirk Presbyterian Church. Thank you for gathering together online. If you are new to this service, we welcome you and we trust that the Lord will meet you in the special way that the Holy Spirit does, even over the internet in these days. This morning we are reminded that it is well with our soul and we are blessed to have musicians that open our service with music that calms down our hearts. Uh, goodness knows that with everything going on around us and things not feeling normal, to come together to worship the Lord, to focus upon Christ Jesus who has this world in his hand makes our soul feel that it is all well. We are in good hands. And so thank you for coming together and praising the Lord and listening for the Lord's guidance in this hour as together we follow Christ. Let me invite you, if you would, at this time to close your eyes as I open us in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you to thank you that even through this pandemic time, your arms surround this world, Lord, and you hold it in love. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together in this time so that we might burn bright as your light. And so, Lord, we come with open ears and open hearts. Lead us, Lord. Restore us so that we can be your servants in this world you love. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as you'll see in our order of service, we continue along the theme of desiring God's restoration in our life. And today's service is looking at being restored for a purpose, that the Lord has an intention uh, that he lifts us from whatever condition we find in life. And so to begin, let me invite you to stand as you may be able as I lead us in the call to worship taken from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock and made my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Prayer of Confession, based in Proverbs 21, 31. Heavenly Father, nothing will ever be better than your guidance and plan. So how is it that I find myself making my own path as if I know better? As you send your good spirit to lead Christ Jesus, so too I am given the spirit to overcome my enemies. Yet I have relied on my own advice or others when you are my true savior. Help me, Holy Spirit, to realize when I begin to rely on any plan other than yours. This I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hear the prophet Daniel's confession while in exile in Babylon concerning Israel, who also had made their own path rather than following God's guidance. Yet the Lord is ever ready to forgive and guide us anew when we confess. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. In Jesus the Christ we are forgiven. Let us take a moment to pass the peace of Christ with one another.
We come to our time where we give the Lord thanks for all the offerings made in His name. You'll find in your announcement sheet today that after this morning's service, after our gathering this morning, at 10.15, uh, we will all be invited to join the I Am Family concert today. Uh, as we have enjoyed this children's choir from Uganda in past years, uh, again today we are invited uh, to worship the Lord along with them, where the Lord opens our heart to an exciting way of worshiping the Lord, seeing how those on other continents come before the Lord uh, to worship Him. And we also have the opportunity to support uh, that children's ministry. Uh, many of you are already aware of the, the orphanage ministry that I Am Family offers for their community. And uh, so as you may be able, uh, please consider supporting them as well. You'll also see on our announcement sheet that we have opportunities to support those that are returning back to school in our local schools, uh, be that to online schools or whether that be in classroom schools. Um, we work with Hope Partners here in the community to be able to provide families that are struggling at this time. So thank you all for considering those gifts as well as supporting our general ministry here. But would you bow your heads with me as I give thanks to the Lord for all of these offerings. Lord, thank you that you are the one who continues to feed us and nurture us, give us all that we need even in this time. And so, Lord, we give back to you, trusting, Lord, that you will direct these to be able to sustain your church every day, each day. Thank you, Lord, for the children that will receive these school supplies, Lord. Thank you for the children of Uganda that gather together to worship you and that we will be blessed by today. Would you receive all of this we offer in the name of Christ Jesus? And all God's people said, amen. Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 14 through 15. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and, he f and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue in these chapters of 8 and 9 in the Gospel of Matthew, where after the Sermon on the Mount, Lord Jesus is giving evidence of the Father's blessing upon his teaching and affirmation of it by recording healings and restoration that the Lord did. And the Lord wants us to know that for us also that this is true. That we read and we learn of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, on the way to follow Jesus. All of that in a way to be able to heal us, to restore us also of the areas in our life where we might feel like a piece of tattered furniture, just as we've used that image for this sermon series. Our life is intended to be a life of power. Think about that, that God gives us, of course, the ability to breathe in and out, but also to move, to be able to care for other people, to be creative with ideas. Life, the way God gives it to us, is meant to be filled with power. And we employ that power to do our work in our daily life, to serve others. Many of you are familiar with the Marvel superhero Thor, and I brought a, a, a little uh, hammer. It's not quite as big as Thor's hammer because I might not be able to, to wield. I'm going to try to pronounce his name, but I may not get it right. I believe his hammer's name is Mjolnir, <laughs> or something like that. His hammer, Mjolnir, or something like that. But by that power, Thor, with his hammer, he wielded this superpower to be able to defend others against enemies, right? The enemies that might come uh, from that land of, uh, come against that land of Asgard. But Thor, as we know from the movie and the stories, was more than a little impetuous. And he decided at one point, all on his own, to try to impress his father that he was going to reignite a dormant war 
And yet, this went really the wrong way. It angered his father, Odin. And Thor, as we know, was banished from Asgard to Earth, and he was stripped of all of his powers and his hammer. Suddenly, Thor felt powerless. He'd lost all the power that he had. And he wondered, Thor wondered, if he could ever serve again, if he would ever wield the power and control that he did earlier in his life. But you know, we, too, can feel like Thor sometimes. There are things that can come into our life where our life is represented by that beautiful piece of furniture, gets pummeled, it gets torn, it gets broken, and suddenly we can feel like, are we ever going to be able to help anyone else, to serve anyone else? And when we think about serving other people, we can think about a couple things as we go into this. The first is, who do we serve? Oftentimes, we go through the motions of life, and we may feel like we show up in places because we have to, because we're expected to. And yet, we always have a choice of who we're going to come and who we're going to serve, who God has brought us before uh, for us to serve in God's name. And then the second question to ask is, why are we serving? Yes, oftentimes, the motivation is to serve our family, or others in the workplace, but we can be motivated to serve others for lots of different reasons, one of, much, one of which may be a paycheck, one of which may, may be obligation. There's lots of different reasons why we may actually be serving other people. And then one day, when we do find that the wind has been knocked out of us, and, and, and we don't know if we have what it takes to even get up anymore. When we find that we've lost that power that once was so easy for us to have, on that day, we're forced to think about the reasons that we even serve. Those very foundational reasons. And so this beautiful account that we read in Matthew of these, these two short verses... The Lord wants us to see how the Lord restored a woman, Peter's mother-in-law, to power to be able to serve. Let's see what we can learn from that, what the Lord has for us. And so verse 14 begins, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. Just two verses These 30 words is what Matthew wrote here. And yet this little account is so effective because Matthew's first listeners would have immediately recognized this story and the points of sadness, compassion, action, and then resolution and restoration. It would have been very familiar. To us, it may just seem like two short verses. Let me give you an example. If if I was to begin to tell you a story and say, you know, so I pulled into this gas station. Well, just immediately, you already know what a gas station is like. And you probably already are thinking, well, there might have been other cars in this gas station. You knew that even before you get out of the car, you'd have to get your credit card ready or your cash. Uh, You'd know that that everyone has to be careful when you walk around a gas station because there are cars coming back and forth, and sometimes there's fuel spilled on the ground, so you have to know where you walk. Those are the kinds of things that we already know as soon as I say, so I pulled into this gas station. And Matthew's listeners would have had the same ideas as soon as this short little story is told. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. Because in that day, that was all too common. Now we should notice here, pause for a second, that Peter, of course, was married. Peter had a wife who also brought her mother to live with Peter and the family in their marriage. And and this was an opportunity for Jesus to reveal God's care not only for all the others that Peter 
and the other disciples and Jesus were caring for, but to bring God's very care into Peter's household. If Peter's wife and mother-in-law had their worries about Peter taking up with this new wandering rabbi, I mean, we can imagine that they might have had these questions for Peter. What? Again? What are you talking about fishing for men? You need to be fishing for fish. We have bills. Who is this Jesus? And yet here was Jesus making time to care for both Peter's mother-in-law and Peter's wife. So, when Jesus entered Peter's house, now we find parallel accounts of this passage also in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, and they tell us that Jesus was returning into this house also with Andrew and with James and John as well. And we remember that Andrew and Peter were brothers And so this is a household that has multiple families living in it and multiple generations. So it was Peter's house, but his mother-in-law was there and there would have been children there, multiple generations there. And so it would have been a home with lots of people crowded, spilling out the door through the day. And yet each person in such a household had their work to do for others. Everyone served in their own way. And they would have thought, as we might even think today, everyone serves so that everyone can survive. That's the role when you're in a a large family and people are living together and trying to survive. Everyone serves so that everyone can survive. And so when one person or, or more than one person suddenly took ill, It became the work of others in the household to care for them, to restore them back so that everyone could do their part. Well, Mark and Luke also tell us that Jesus and his disciples were returning from the synagogue if you will, that, that at that time when they were coming into the house, they were coming from the synagogue in Capernaum where Jesus had healed a man of an evil spirit. And so seeing that God was was active through Jesus' ministry that day, we can easily imagine why Peter and Andrew and the others brought Jesus home to heal Peter's own mother-in-law of her illness. Luke's description in his gospel tells us just that, that they asked Jesus to help her. And so it says that when Jesus saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever, right? And so Peter's mother-in-law had been lying incapacitated for a while by this fever. And everyone hearing this account of someone lying down with a fever in the ancient world, they would have known immediately that fever could portend death death. And so suddenly, all those listening would have gone, oh no. Now we, we hear fever and we think, oh, fever. Oh, okay, well let's see. Acetaminophen, Tylenol, or do I this time, do I go for the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? You know? but that's what we think of when we come across a fever. We don't think death. In the ancient world, if someone had a fever without without these medications that we have today, they immediately thought of potential death. And so, just as we can imagine having a loved one that suddenly in a life-threatening situation, maybe in a hospital, everyone suddenly would be waiting to hear if the fever of Peter's mother-in-law would continue to overtake her. And even possibly the family with her. How would it impact everyone emotionally, even physically? And so this is the drama of this very short account. This sick mother-in-law was likely sorry. We can imagine that she felt that her condition required the attention of those others in the household. Meanwhile, she could not do the work that she was expected to do to contribute so that everyone um, could, could be the recipient of what she could bring to the family. 
She was worried if, if she would live. Her daughter must have been distraught over the possibility of losing her mother. The grandchildren running through the house would have stolen peeks into the room where she was lying down, suffering, hearing her perhaps moan, fearful of losing their grandmother. Everyone would have been concerned if the fever would spread to others, to the children. And so how could anything normal continue in Peter's house while the family waited upon her? Even as her fever continued to set in, they were reminded by each other that the rabbis taught that they were not allowed to touch someone with a fever. And so imagine the increasing loneliness of Peter's mother-in-law. If she was even able to continue in consciousness when suddenly Jesus arrives. Now, this same sense of losing the ability to work and serve and care for others, that can happen to us as well. It, it comes across when, when our world suddenly comes to a halt. And, and, and maybe it's not a fever that can suddenly incapacitate us, though, though in this day of COVID virus, it, it certainly could be. It might be a job loss. It might be the loss of a loved one in our life. It might be a family fight that we've gotten into, a marriage in crisis. It could be an argument in our household about what is our common goals and what are we trying to do for each other. But we too, for all of these different kinds of reasons, we can become overwhelmed, depressed, retreat away by ourselves, become lonely, so that we don't even see the purpose of getting up and trying it anything again. We can be so frustrated and angry. And yet others, when we find ourselves in such a situation, they can see what we're going through. It's hard for us to hide what's really going on in our heart, in our mind. Others can see it when we've lost that little hop in our step. And they see us and they're sad for us because they know we're going through something very difficult. They would like to help us because they love us, but also because we have helped them. We are important in their life. In some way, others really do need us. And whether to work, to serve, to be a friend, to help us see things in a different way, we are all valuable to one another. And so, for different reasons, we are not certain if we can face another day when we're just caught in that place of needing to be restored, needing to be healed of whatever has knocked us down. And others around us, when they sense that, they don't know what to do, except like Peter, they can ask Jesus to come and to heal us. That's when we lift one another in prayer. We do this when we bring Christ's presence to each other when we know that one another is suffering. We're led by the Holy Spirit when we see a brother or sister in Christ, someone else that is not doing well. But Christ always heals us, as we see, for a purpose, just as in this woman's life. And so it says in verse 15 that Jesus touched her and the fever left her and she got up and she began to serve him. Do you remember back that leprous man who made his way through the crowd so determined that he would seek God's healing in Christ and Jesus touched him? Jesus does the same thing here. Matthew reminds us that Jesus touches us. He came and he touched this woman's hand, it says, something even that the rabbinic traditions had forbade. And at his very touch, Matthew wrote that the fever abandoned her. It left her. And just imagine what that feels like. The fever, the burning behind your eyes, suddenly running out of you. The sweat on your body beginning to dry. Your heart that you could feel thumping now beginning to relax. The Father, the Holy Spirit, 
and Christ himself work together in that moment to restore, to heal this woman from the fear that they were overcome by what they could not control. You see, everyone in that household suddenly felt out of control. And here, their poor mother, mother mother-in-law, was incapacitated. And no one knew how to control this fever. And yet God has the power to come in and to control what we cannot, to relieve us of that fear of what we cannot control. The things that knock us down so that we can't get up and we don't have the wherewithal to serve others, we may not have control over, but the Lord does. And when Christ rescues us from these dark places, whatever form they might take, we begin to feel the stress and the pain melt away from our life. And we know that God is in our life restoring us. We may not understand how God does this, but we know it because of the relief that we begin to feel. A hope that is born again in us to engage and to serve others. But this time, our focus, our purpose in serving will be different. And we see how it is from Peter's mother-in-law. Because it says, and she got up and she began to serve him. Literally, it says, and she was raised... And she served him. This woman woke from that fever, from the chills, from the shivers, from the headache, everything that she was going through. And all she could see was Jesus at her side. And she knew that no one else in that house had control over that fever. But there was Jesus. And suddenly, this wandering rabbi that Peter and Andrew would go off with and try to fish for men, suddenly had restored her, had healed her. And she could welcome her grandchildren into her arms. That there would be more life, that there would be more days that she could serve them. But her first priority was to serve Jesus, who had healed her. God who had worked through Christ Jesus, that serving Christ would now be her first priority. We see it all the time in stories when someone whose life is saved falls down at the feet of their their rescuer and say, I owe my life to you. I want to give everything to you because without you, I wouldn't be here. And so this woman who previously believed everyone serves so that everyone survives, has now realized, I have been healed, restored, so that I may serve Christ, who has come to save everyone. We are restored, we're healed, so that we can serve Christ, who has come to save everyone else. And all of our service for Christ is in His goal to save everyone else. And so we don't want to take our eyes off of thanking Christ for having healed us from things in the past and what He will heal us and restore us from where we are today. Your life and my life is meant to be used in power. It's power given by God to be able to be used for God's goodness as He saves this world. Where is the Lord going to restore you in these days? We all need to be restored and healed in some area of suffering that we're doing. Look for God's restoration. And when it comes, thank the Lord and serve Him first. Let's thank the Lord together in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank You that You come in and that You have power, that You have authority over the things that we don't. And so, Lord, you know those areas in our life where we need your healing restoration. Thank you, Lord, that you are at work right now in that area. And, Lord, when we come out of it and we sense that and cannot deny that it's been your power to do that, Lord, may our eyes look to you 
with thankfulness to serve you first in all that you call us to do. In your name we pray, Jesus. Let us continue in prayer. Holy, holy, holy are you, God Almighty. You are sufficient for all our needs. We wait with great expectation of what you are going to do during this time of our lives. We wait upon you with courage and put our trust in you. Help us, O oh God, to not give in to anger or despair, but to be confident in your provisions for us. Father, we know that you are with us. You know exactly where we are and what we are facing, and you are walking with us. You are providing for us, and you are protecting us along the way. We thank you, O Jehovah Jireh, for all of your provisions, and we do confess that your grace is sufficient for us. Help us, O Lord, to grow our compassion, understanding, and love for one another during this time of social distancing, illness, financial and emotional difficulties. We are aware that there is not only a political, but also a spiritual battle going on all around us. Help us to turn to you and pick up our sword of truth and your belt of righteousness. We thank you, O oh God, that you are willing to bring us through this storm, and we take courage in your promise of a better future. We rejoice, O oh God, in the knowledge that you are in control and that you have already won the battle against the evil one. We pray, O oh God, that this will be a time of restoration, a time when people draw close to you again, a time of healing, and a time of revival. Restore us to you, O oh God, and show us how we can serve you to bring glory to your name. Father, we lift all those Christians all around the world up to you that have been imprisoned and persecuted. Be with the over 600 Christians that have been thrown in prison without a cause or a chance of a trial in Eritrea, Africa, and all around the world. Have mercy, O oh God, and strengthen your servants. Father, be with them, and may the voices of your martyrs be heard all around the world. Bless them, O oh God, and encourage and protect them. We continue to lift our country and its leaders up to you. May they be led by your Holy Spirit and not by their ambitions. We pray for unity, not division. We continue to lift our first responders up to you. May you continue to bless and protect them. Give them strength and courage, O oh Lord. We pray that you will continue to give hope and strength to those that are fighting cancer, like Cheryl Boyle, Carrie Baird, Dave Vaughn, and so many others. Be with our sweet sister, Debbie Bruce, as she is suffering from some medical issues and is going through several tests and treatments. Give her strength and comfort her. Guide the doctors so that she might feel better soon. Be with our teachers, students, and parents as the new school year is approaching the uncertainty and anxiety how to meet the need of everyone and how to teach without a structured school environment. Guide them, O oh Lord, be with them. Give us love, grace, and mercy for one another in these uncertain times. We lift our spoken and unspoken prayers up to you, knowing that you are already working on them and hearing them before we can even talk, before we can even say them. So let us now pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping the Lord together this morning. The Lord is good, and we trust that we will all together enjoy the I Am Family concert, uh, which will be available uh, 
uh, live streamed right after our service this morning. So let me invite you to stand as you may be able as I give our closing benediction, which is, again, our memory verse for this week, taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, where we read the words of Zechariah, who has been given voice and reminds us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might now serve God without fear. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.